Chapter 3 They rode on later that afternoon, after Crowley had eaten. He removed the thumb cuffs from the two men and instead tied all three men's hands firmly in front of them so they could ride more easily. He roped their horses together and tethered a lead rope to one of them as well, just in case the men were tempted to try to escape. His dark mood of the morning had left him now, and he felt positively cheerful as they rode. Holt glanced up at him as he began to whistle a jaunty folk tune. "'What are you doing?' he asked, a dark frown forming on his brow. Crowley shrugged and grinned at him. "'I'm in a good mood,' he explained. Holt's eyebrow went up. Crowley had noticed that the Hibernian seemed to use that facial reaction quite often. So, you're in a good mood. Why are you making that shrieking sound? I'm whistling. I'm whistling a jaunty tune. That's not whistling, it's shrieking. At best, it's shrilling, Holt replied. Crowley turned in the saddle to regard him with some dignity. I'll have you know, my whistling has been widely praised in Hog Arth Fife. A dour place it must be if people consider that shrill noise to be musical. The overweight soldier with the leg wound began whining in pain, interrupting their discussion of what was and was not considered good music. The three soldiers were riding in front of Crowley and Holt. Holt urged his horse forward a few paces to catch up with the man. First, it's his shrilling. Now it's your whining, he said. Will this noise ever stop? What's your trouble? My leg hurts, the soldier whined. Of course it does, Holt told him. I put an arrow through it. Did you expect it not to hurt? The soldier was taken aback by this pragmatic answer. Crowley, listening, smiled to himself. From what he'd seen of Holt so far, if the soldier expected sympathy, he was talking to the wrong man entirely. I need to rest, the man complained. This riding is jolting my leg. No, Holt told him. You need to shut up. But if you can't bring yourself to do that, I'll do something to take your mind off that leg of yours. The soldier looked at him fearfully. He was reasonably sure that Holt was not proposing to alleviate his pain. What will you do? he asked. I'll shoot you through the other leg, Holt told him. That'll spread the pain around. You'd shoot a helpless man? The soldier cringed away in his saddle as far as he could without losing his balance and falling off. Holt regarded him steadily before he replied. Don't ever forget that you threatened to cut off my friend's nose while his hands were tied behind him. That's not likely to win you any sympathy from me. The soldier opened his mouth to reply, looked at Holt and shut it again with a slightly audible clop. Holt, satisfied that he had got the message, nodded once and reined in his horse, falling back to ride beside Crowley once more. The sandy-haired ranger grinned cheerfully at him. So, I'm your friend, am I? he asked. Holt looked straight ahead for a few seconds before replying. As long as you don't start whistling again. They camped that evening in a small clearing beside a stream of fresh cold water. While Holt disappeared into the woods with his bow, Crowley untied the prisoners one at a time then refastened their hands behind their backs with thumb cuffs. He sat them beside each other, leaning against a fallen tree. In each of their saddlebags he found a blanket, and he draped these over the men. "'Aren't you going to give us something to eat?' one of them asked in an aggrieved tone. Crowley shook his head. "'Shouldn't think so. A night without eating won't harm you.' He poured water into a tin cup, and let them drink as much as they wanted, however. When he had finished with the men, he lit a fire. He had some potatoes in his cooking kit, and he set them to boil in a blackened pot. As the water began to bubble, Holt reappeared, carrying a plump rabbit, already skinned and cleaned. Just the thing, Crowley said happily. Nothing like a fresh rabbit to take away the pangs. 
The soldier who had spoken earlier looked up hopefully. Can we? No, Holt and Crowley said together. They quickly jointed the rabbit, rolled the pieces in flour with a few dried herbs mixed in, and then melted butter in an iron fry pan over the fire. As the floured joints went into the hot butter and began to sizzle, Crowley sighed happily. He enjoyed food. Much better way to do it than putting it on a spit over the fire, he commented. Takes far too long to cook it that way. When the rabbit pieces were golden and cooked through, Crowley added a heap of greens to the pan, covering it so that they would wilt down quickly. Then he and Holt enjoyed their meal together, sitting opposite each other across the campfire in companionable silence. From time to time, one of the prisoners moaned as the delicious smell of fried spiced rabbit drifted to them. Crowley and Holt ignored the sound. When they finished their meal, they licked the last traces of rabbit, butter and potato from their fingers, then wiped them on the grass. Crowley made coffee and watched as Holt added a large dollop of honey to his cup. Doesn't that spoil the taste? he asked. Holt looked up at him, considered the question, then replied, no. Crowley smiled at the one word answer. You don't talk much, do you? Again, those dark eyes lifted and met his. I say what needs to be said. Crowley shrugged good-naturedly. Probably a good thing. I tend to talk too much sometimes. I'd noticed. Does it bother you? Crowley asked. He felt an instinctive liking for this dark stranger, and he sensed that Holt thought well of him in return. Holt shrugged now. It keeps you from whistling. Crowley snorted with laughter at the reply. Holt maintained a bleak and serious facade, but deep down, Crowley could detect a deadpan vein of humour in the man. You said earlier today that you wanted to talk about something, Holt said. Crowley nodded, gathering his thoughts before he began. You seem to share a lot of the same skills, he said, and the same weapons. I noticed you carry a sax knife and a throwing knife like mine. I wondered where you came by them. Crowley, of course, carried his two knives in the distinctive Ranger issue double scabbard. Holtz were in separate scabbards, placed close together on the left side of his belt. He glanced at them now, where the belt was draped over a rock beside the fireplace. My mentor gave them to me, he said. He was a Ranger like you. Crowley sat up at this piece of information. A ranger, he said. In Hibernia? What was his name? He called himself Pritchard. He was an amazing man. He was, indeed, Crowley affirmed. And now it was Holt's turn to look surprised. You knew him? Crowley nodded eagerly. I was his apprentice for five years. He taught me everything I know. How did you come to meet him? He turned up at De Drogella some three years ago. He took me under his wing and taught me silent movement, knife work, tracking and the rest. I could already shoot, but he tightened up my technique quite a bit. Howley noticed the hesitation and correction when Holt mentioned the name of the place where he'd met Pritchard, but he let it pass. Yes, he was very big on technique and practice. Holt agreed. Crowley smiled at the memory of his old teacher. He had a saying, an ordinary archer practices until he gets it right. A ranger practices until he never gets it wrong, Holt finished the saying, and they both smiled. They sat in silence for a few moments. What became of him? Crowley asked. Is he still in Drogella, did you say? Holt shook his head. He moved on. I had some unpleasantness there, and I had to leave. I decided to come to Araluen to see if I could contact the rangers, perhaps join the corps and complete my training. Pritchard moved on to one of the western kingdoms in Hibernia. He said he was unable to come back here. Crowley nodded sadly. That's right. He was hounded out of the country, on a totally trumped-up charge, of course. 
but sad to say, that's the way the Ranger Corps has become these days. It's all changed for the worse. How do you mean, Holt said. You seem pretty much like the Rangers that Pritchard told me about. I'm glad to hear that, Crowley replied. But things have changed. He reached for his quiver. He'd noticed that the fletching on two of his arrows was working loose, and he set about repairing them. Holt watched him, then rummaged in his own pack and passed him a fletching jig. Here, use this. It'll make it easier. Thanks, said Crowley, stripping the old feathered flights from the shaft. He settled the shaft in the fletching jig, which would hold the shaft and the new flights in place until the glue had set, and began to repair the first arrow. After a minute or two, he addressed Holt's earlier question. Things have changed, he repeated. These days, the Ranger Corps is little more than a social club for lazy young nobles. There's no training, no apprenticeships. You buy your way in now. I'm one of the few remaining Rangers who were properly trained. And they're trying to squeeze me out. Why would they do that? Holt asked. Crowley shrugged. I suppose I'm an embarrassment to them. I've just been to Castle Araluen to have my knuckles wrapped over a ridiculous complaint. It's happened to others before me. Pritchard was one of the first. But since then, others have been squeezed out as well. I figured there are maybe only a dozen properly trained rangers left in the kingdom these days. And we're widely scattered. But why? Who would want to destroy such an effective force? Can't the king do something? You're the king's rangers after all, Holt asked, and Crowley smiled sadly. The king doesn't want to know what's going on. And as for who would want to destroy the rangers, the answer's simple. There's a group of barons, the royal council, who have the old king completely under their influence. He's sick and senile, and he has no idea what's going on. It's my belief that they're manoeuvring to take over the throne. They've got the king to agree to virtually exile Prince Duncan to the northeast coast. The king is powerless, and they're making sure that there is no cohesive group who might support Prince Duncan when it comes time for him to assume the throne. Who's behind it all? Holt asked. Crowley gestured to the three men tied up a few metres away. You'll meet him tomorrow, he said. I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure it's Morgarath. 